Thank you, Brother Judah. <clears throat> In this vision, the Apostle John had of the holy city, the new Jerusalem, <clears throat> it's as if at this point his, his vision has been interrupted. But it's not a bad interruption. This is a good interruption because it's, a, it's God speaking from the throne. <clears throat> has something to say to John. He tells him to write. This is a word for all who read the record of John's vision of the holy city. And there is a promise that accompanies the vision. So this isn't just something that John saw. There's, there's good words that come with it. It's a promise about what God is going to do for those that overcome the world and a promise for those who do not. It's the great delight and the hope of the people of God that God is going to do certain things for us. <clears throat> And give certain things to those that he has chosen, to those who overcome the world. God is not a spectator in his salvation. He did not set some kind of machine in motion and then sit back and kind of watch what's going to happen. That's not at all the case. <clears throat> all things are of God. He is both the rewarder and the reward of the people of God. Everything that he's doing through Jesus Christ is in preparation for this city which is to be his eternal habitation. So God himself speaks in this vision, but this is not for John's ears only. This good word of God has been heard by saints of all generations. <clears throat> God wants us all to know, and from his own mouth, what he is going to do and what he is going to give to them that overcome the world, those who trust in him. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life, freely. <clears throat> Notice now that God says, I will give. Right. No one is just going to take it. God is going to give it. Amen. No man could possibly take it. This kind of thing belongs to God alone, <clears throat> and yet we read here that he is happy to give it to us. Yes. Do you think that God is austere and stingy and not willing to give abundantly? Well, hear this. He said to Abraham, Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And to Moses, the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me in the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And he said to Israel, I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding, and I will give them an heart to know me that I am the Lord. And they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. That's the result of what he gave. Right. And Ezekiel says, And I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them an heart of flesh. Jesus said, Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Amen. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. <clears throat> and in Revelation chapter 2, he promises, I will give thee a crown of life. And verse 28, I will give him the morning star. These are just some of the things that God just, he just gives. This is the kind of God we serve. <clears throat> Now I ask you, how else could we get these things if God did not give them to us? Because there is no other way to obtain things like this. <clears throat> and let me remind you, he's under no obligation to give these things, except that he's promised that he would, <clears throat> out of his own goodness and grace. God is a giver, and he gives very good things, but not to everyone. For example, if you are laboring and heavy laden, you don't get any rest unless you come to Jesus. Then he'll give it to you. Likewise, God is going to give to drink of the fountain of the water of life, but only to those who are thirsty. If you're not thirsty, then God will not give you to drink of it. <clears throat> but if you are thirsty, you won't have to go searching for it. You won't have to try to scrape up enough money to buy a drink of it. You won't have to assemble an envoy to make requests for it. There won't be any quest for the fountain of water of life in the holy city. In this world, foolish men seek a fountain of youth 
but the saints know where it is. Amen. We don't have to go on an expedition to get it. We won't have to beg for it. We won't have to wonder how the water tastes or if it will really quench our thirst, for God himself will give it to us. Amen. This is all about God. <clears throat> it is his city. This is the city that the Lamb built for the Father, and he gives the things that are in it. To him that is a thirst. <clears throat> but who is the one that thirsts? Who is thirsty and what is it that they thirst for? Is the Holy Spirit just speaking in generalities like thirsty for whatever? Whatever, if you're wanting something, God will give you from this fountain? Or is he being specific? <clears throat> or whatever it is that we thirst for, the fountain for it can only be seen in the holy city. So we know right away that this is a special kind of thirst because only this fountain quenches this thirst. If this thirst could be quenched here, there would be no need for a fountain there <clears throat> and for this promise to accompany John's vision. The promise of this unique fountain tells us there is a unique thirst that the people of God have that can only be quenched by God giving us to drink of the fountain of the water of life. That means that there is a thirst that no saint has had quenched yet. <clears throat> Until the world has passed away and the judgment complete, until we are gathered together in the holy city, there is an unquenched thirst that remains in us. It may not be very easy to define, but if you have it, you know what it is. And even now, you will want to drink from this fountain. <clears throat> now consider the context that we hear this promise in. <clears throat> this is after the first heaven and first earth have passed away. This is after the judgment that God says this, <clears throat> after the devil is cast into the lake of fire, after John sees the new Jerusalem descend from God out of heaven, he hears God speak this promise. Is this a spiritual fountain that we can drink from in the present time? Or is it a fountain that can only be partaken of in the holy city? Without a doubt, Jesus has already given us water to drink. When Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And in John chapter 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And in John 7, 37, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. <clears throat> now all of those sayings of Jesus having to do have to do with our quench being thirst, our thirst being quenched in the present time. <clears throat> and these things are certainly true. These are, these are presently active. We've partaken of this water and presently partake of these things that Jesus spoke of. We do partake of a feast of fat things and wine on the lees in the present time, in a first fruit sense, that is, by faith. But there is a fuller feast yet to come, and we know this. Is it possible to, our, to avail ourselves of the grace of God, overcome the world, be placed with the sheep and rejoice in the day of judgment, and enter into eternal rest, into the holy city, thirsting? That is where the fountain is. Is it possible that the saints could be saved from everything and yet be thirsting for something? Yes, it is. And this promise addresses that common and holy condition. <clears throat> Life in this world makes us thirsty. In every arena, wherever you go, if you're in this world, in this body, <clears throat> there's all kinds of dissatisfaction and limitations, sin and death everywhere, disappointments, barriers, or restrictions in the mortal body. If things are not good at home, it makes us long for better. But even if things are great at home, we know there's still something better. See, we're always thirsting. There's a, the, all the, the fullness is not here. 
But we have this treasure, indeed we do have a treasure, in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We don't deny that we have a great treasure presently, but we also cannot deny that we have it in earthen vessels. There are all kinds of afflictions and troubles associated with our bodies. The greater portion of our spiritual warfare is against our own carnal natures. But in addition to that, we are pilgrims in a world that is steeped in sin. There are many kinds of spiritual powers in the world that war against our souls, whether it's in the workplace or in the home. Nearly everywhere we go and everywhere we look, there is enmity against the saints of God and against God himself. As blessed as the gathering of the saints is in this world, none of us would say that our meetings are absolutely perfect. <clears throat> and the height of fullness in Christ. None of us would say that yet. If we are to overcome the world, then we must engage in a good fight of faith in every place and at all times. Jesus keeps us while we are in the world, and he supplies abundantly. God supplies all our need according to his riches and glory, but there is something more that we desire at the same time. This is a dis I'm talking about living by faith now. This is a description of that. <clears throat> We have the abundance of salvation, but it has to be obtained and handled and kept by faith. <clears throat> In the midst of enmity and conflict, and battle makes you thirsty. The battle is due to the warfare between life and death, between this world and that world, between the old and the new. <clears throat> Afflictions are intended to make us thirsty. <clears throat> this is by design. See, Jesus is actually making you thirsty for this fountain. Amen. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Our afflictions are light only in comparison to the glory. Now, when you're in the midst of the affliction, you know, you're not thinking, hey, this is light. This is, ah, this is nothing. Bring it on. You're not thinking that in the midst of the affliction. That, this is in comparison to the glory. Yeah. <clears throat> If we have the right mind and we have our eyes set in the right place, our afflictions actually work for us. <clears throat> As some have said, make them your employees. They will become our servants. Instead of your afflictions making you angry or casting you down <clears throat> or causing you to question God or making us take our hand from the plow and go back into the world, let your afflictions make you thirsty. That is a thirst for the right things, not more money, not better business, not thirsty for closer family, not thirsty for more possessions, not peace with this world, but a thirst that can only be quenched of the water of life <clears throat> in the holy city. The people of God are indeed a thirsty people. We sojourn in a land where no water is, <clears throat> at least not the kind of water that we are looking for. This is why Abraham continued looking for a city. <clears throat> he was promised the land of Canaan. He was given the miraculous seed in Isaac, made wealthy and honored among men. And he lived and died in the land of promise that God had given to him, but he never built a house there. After God had given him such great promises, and after Abraham saw these things begin to be fulfilled, and he knew it, why did he continue to look for a city? Because he was thirsty. There's more. He knew there was more, and he was thirsty for it. Yeah. Now, there's another way to express this thirst that I'm talking about, <clears throat> and it's hope. This is the hope of eternal life. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. This thirst is a thirst of hope. We endure being thirsty when we know that God is going to give us of the fountain of the water of life freely. Instead of making us weak like natural thirst does, this thirst actually causes us to endure. Amen. The reason we can maintain such a powerful thirst and not faint is by reason of what we are thirsting for. The saints have a driving thirst that moves them forward until they get the thing that God has promised. <clears throat> but the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. What is it that we thirst for that cannot be fulfilled while this world stands? It is the perfection of being in the presence of God in the holy city. Amen. 
Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. David said in Psalm 42, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And in Psalm 63, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Christ is cultivating in his people an unquenchable thirst to be in the presence of God where there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. We have a thirst that can only be quenched in the holy city. It is the perfection of fullness of life, not accompanied by death. We thirst for the full treasure without the earthen vessel. And there God will give us to drink at the very source of life. It's a fountain of life. We will then be filled with nothing but life. Filled with nothing but satisfaction. Filled only with strength, vigor, and vitality. Filled only with peace and joy. Filled with all fullness, never lacking anything. Never declining, never weakening. Life springs forth endlessly in the holy city. In fact, not only is there this fountain of life, there's also a river of life and a tree of life. There's a lot of life in the holy city. A lot of sustenance. No death. <clears throat> they shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy, the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. <clears throat> this is essential to the holy city. Just the truth that this fountain is there tells us that the saints have a need for such a thing. And if we will pay attention, our experience in this world confirms that we need it. <clears throat> now, this is in preparation. <clears throat> Certain preparations have to be made for those who will be assembled into the holy city. <clears throat> And certain ha preparations have to be made in order for God to dwell there. If the tabernacle of God is going to be with men, and if he's going to dwell with them, and they are going to be his people, and he is going to be their God, well, first God's got to take some things away, like tears and death and sorrow and crying and pain and all the former things. We've got to take that away first. <clears throat> and other things have to be installed in the people and filled up. <clears throat> like eternal bodies, and the confidence and the boldness that comes from passing the judgment seat of Christ. And there is the fountain of water of life that we read about here in the beginning of the vision of the holy city, and the inheritance of all things, and God being our God, and we being his sons. So one of the first things that God is going to do at the outset is to quench the thirst of the saints. You might be thirsty when you get there, but you won't be for long. Our thirst will be quenched, and we will be strengthened for the work that is ahead, and we will never experience thirst again. Let me ask you, and you just answer, you commune with your own soul now. How thirsty are you? God will give us of this fountain freely. All you can drink will be provided without limit and without price. Isaiah prophesied of this, chapter 49, verse 10, They shall not hunger nor thirst. Neither shall the heat nor sun smite them, for he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. Yeah. And the fulfillment of this is announced in Revelation chapter 7, concerning those who came through great tribulation. Chapter 7, verse 16, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Amen. The hungering and thirsting is experienced here, but not in the world to come. <clears throat> and in verse 7 of Revelation chapter 21, the second verse in our text, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. The warfare and the overcoming is accomplished here and now. And the inheritance of all things 
is obtained there. And wonder, one of the wonderful things to see in this vision of the holy city is that in the world to come, God is not holding back anything from the saints. <clears throat> Now we understand better why Paul prayed this way for the Ephesians, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Peter wrote that God has begotten us to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. <clears throat> what is our inheritance in Christ? Just exactly how big is it? All things. I don't know where to begin to expound that. It's everything. And where, if I were to begin, where would I end? <clears throat> God's inheritance is not like the inheritance of men. Men have an estate and it gets divvied up between some people, but God's inher in God's inheritance, everyone gets everything. Yeah. Amen. All things are ours. <clears throat> Whatever God has, it will be yours. If you overcome the world, <clears throat> God has graciously given us the grandest incentive to overcome the world that can possibly be given. All things. There isn't any more. <laughs> that is everything that cannot be shaken. All things that are eternal, <clears throat> that will abide after the passing of the present heavens and earth. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Amen. Keep in mind that there will be a new heavens and a new earth. Remember <clears throat> that the magnitude and the glory of the inheritance, whatever it may be, it's also rightfully fitting to give it to Jesus. When you think about the magnitude of it, you think, well, I don't deserve all things. Well, what does Jesus deserve? We are co-heirs with him. This is his inheritance too. If you think the inheritance is too much for you, then remember the same inheritance belongs to Christ, and it's not too much for him. If children, then heirs... Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. <clears throat> How big can you think when it comes to eternal things? How high are you able to see concerning the inheritance of the saints? <clears throat> to Jesus, the Lamb of God was given to sit on the right hand of God, and heaven ascribes to him worthiness to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. And yet Jesus promises us his flock. <clears throat> to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne Amen. as I overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. <clears throat> Paul states it in the epistle to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also Freely give us all things. Amen. And to the Corinthians, therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. <clears throat> And he says, I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now notice there's a slight change of wording here from the way this usually reads in the prophets. The prophets said, and repeatedly, I will be their God, and ye, or they, shall be my people. And just a few verses up in, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. <clears throat> Although the holy city is all about togetherness and unity unto God and for God, individuality is not abolished there. It's not lost. This is a promise made to every individual believer as well as to the whole of them. God is speaking to you here. No one else can overcome the world for you. <clears throat> You have to work it out yourself by the grace of God. Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep, and all the saints have a powerful ministry to one another, helping one another in the faith. But in the end, each one of us has to overcome the world 
and we will all stand as individuals before Christ in the judgment. Therefore, the Lord has spoken these great things to us on a personal level. Him that is a thirst, he that overcometh, his God, he will be my son. This is one of the great joys of heaven, is having God give unto us as individuals as well as to the collective, and having him be glad to be identified with us as individuals as well as a whole body. <clears throat> He'll say, that's my son. I'm his God. That's the way it is. <clears throat> now, if you gather a great multitude <clears throat> of these believers, so great a number that they cannot be numbered, and you gather them all together in one place at one time, all the overcomers, all the heirs, all the sons of God, then you will be in the holy city, yes. New Jerusalem. Amen. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. <clears throat> These wonderful promises are not held out <clears throat> to those mentioned in verse 8. Yeah. God will not be their God. Right. They shall not be his sons. Along with this glorious vision and the gracious word of the Lord comes a warning to those who refuse his goodness, yeah. to those who would give up the fight, to those who would seek to have their, qu their thirst quenched by the world, who would rather fill up here than wait yeah. and be thirsty and be filled there. Yeah. When we get to the end of John's vision of the revealed Christ, the warnings get fewer now, but they are still here. In the remaining chapter, chapter 22, there's two or three more coming. This is a warning lest we think that God is soft on mankind, or unless some think or teach, which they do, that God is going to save everyone because he loves us all so much, he just can't bear to part with any of us. Any man that will be in the holy city will be there because of Jesus Christ. Amen. To allow anyone into the city who did not honor the Son would be to suggest that the Father has despised the blood of his own Lamb. Amen. And that is not going to happen. Amen. We overcome because the Father loves the Son and we love the Son. <clears throat> who are the fearful? I'm not going to go through each one of these. These are pretty self-explanatory, but I do want to talk about this first one, the fearful. <clears throat> who are the fearful now? <clears throat> Those who draw back in fear have not done so out of misunderstanding. This is not like, like before you put your child to bed, you, okay, now let's look in the closet. See, there's not anyone there. You shouldn't be afraid. Let's look under the bed. See, your fears are unfounded. That's not what this fearful is. <clears throat> That's not what we're talking about here. This isn't just a misunderstanding, a misguided person. The Greek word means dread. It means they dread God. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> they dread the thought of God and of Christ. The word also means, by implication, it means faithless. <clears throat> People who are tender-hearted don't draw back from God. Amen. They draw near. Amen. The fearful won't come to God because they do not believe the record that he has given of his son. They are not to be pitied. They are to be rebuked. Now, I'll not go through the entire list here, as I said, but God speaks precisely here. Anyone that is found <clears throat> in any of these sins when the Lord comes will in no wise enter the holy city. Amen. They shall have their part, and we might add their rightful part, in the lake of fire. But not only is this a warning against falling away <clears throat> and a help in time of temptation, but it's also part of the promise given to the overcomers. To him that overcometh, rest assured, none of these people are going to be there. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. How can God wipe away all tears from our eyes if these people are going to be there? Yeah. How can death, sorrow, crying, and pain be gone if these are there? Mm -hmm. How can the former things be passed away, and how can all things be new <clears throat> if rebellious sinners are there with the overcomers? Mm -hmm. If the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and liars are going to be there, then my thirst is not going to be quenched in the holy city. We want no part of the inheritance if these are there. 
we had to fight a fierce battle against these to overcome the world. And how can we have a strong desire to dwell in a city where our enemies abide? God has made it clear to the saints where the holy city is being prepared, where it comes down from, where it comes to, the purpose of the city, what God will do there, what he will give there, who is in it, and who will not be in it. <clears throat> People in the churches in our time take great delight in having these kind of people in their assemblies. But God has said from his throne that their part will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone. <clears throat> While the saints drink freely from the fountain of water of life, they will spend eternity dying the second death in the lake of fire. <clears throat> they are some of the ones who made us thirst. Then they will be thirsty and their thirst will not be quenched. These are the things that he that sat upon the throne told John to write. Amen. The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end said this. <clears throat> These words are true, and it is done. Yeah. In closing, brethren, I want to exhort you, as I exhort myself in these things, to recognize this thirst that you have. <clears throat> and it's a thirst because you're a pilgrim and a stranger in this world. Don't fall into the snare of trying to quench that thirst here. Amen. Be patient, endure, be strong and of good courage, and wait, and God will give you to drink. He will give you to drink freely of the fountain of the water of life. Amen. I want to leave you with 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>